Not all the Gospels are easy to hear, and this is certainly one of them, because this one about the vineyard workers tends to violate our basic sense of fairness. After all, didn't those who work the whole day truly deserve more than those who only worked one hour? But in order to understand this parable, we have to remind ourselves that Jesus was not concerned about teaching fair labor practices. Rather, Jesus' purpose was to use familiar images to try to explain the ways of the kingdom of God. What then did this rather unsettling little story tell those who were listening to it in the days of St. Matthew who recorded it in the last third of the first century? Recall that St. Matthew was probably writing his gospel for Jews who had converted, in a sense, to being Christians. Such communities had their own questions and problems trying to understand where and how their beliefs in Jesus fit in with the religious tradition in which they had been raised and were probably still very much involved. As Jewish people, they understood themselves to be that unique race chosen by God. But now they believed that Jesus of Nazareth was truly the Messiah that they had been expecting. But not all their fellow Jews agreed with them. As some of those questioned them and even rejected them, at the same time, they were observing non-Jews coming to believe in Jesus. What about these latecomers, these Gentiles who knew nothing about the Torah, who never practiced Jewish initiation rites, or ever observed the Sabbath, or kept the dietary laws? Could they now simply believe in Jesus without first becoming Becoming Jewish? How could they get off, or maybe rather in, so easily? Such a base might seem senseless to us now, so many centuries later. But these questions were very, very real, and the debate surrounding them could at times be very heated. Yet that is really what the parable of the vineyard workers is trying to address. The truth that in this new covenant established by Jesus, the newcomers were indeed to be accepted on the same footing as the longtime believers. Indeed, their faith made them as welcome to the reward promised by God as those who had had a long history already of belief and practice. In order to understand this better, we have to appreciate that the reward that God is promising, endless life in his kingdom, can't be weighed, it can't be measured, it can't be apportioned into smaller segments, it can't be quantified at all. Some cannot get more of it than others nor can it ever be earned according to the length of time someone has believed or the amount of time they have prayed or faithfully practiced their faith. Well, what's the sense, we might start to think? Why practice the faith at all? Why make the effort to come to Mass each Sunday and do all that we are expected to do if someone can merit the same reward with an 11th hour conversion. When we start to think in that fashion, we are in fact very much in tune with those communities for whom St. Matthew was writing his gospel. And it is then that we have to start to be very careful. For in order not to feel that way, in order to understand what Jesus is teaching in this parable, we have to appreciate the truth that what God is promising 
is so far beyond what any of us could ever possibly earn by our own merit that it is in fact a gift that not one of us, no matter how saintly, could ever say we deserve. Thus there is only one response in faith before such a promise, and that is to give thanks. That is why the central prayer of an authentically Christian community has to be just that. Eucharist, thanksgiving, the thanksgiving for the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which has opened for us hope of the kingdom of heaven and the possibility of life without any end in God's presence. So whether we come to that faith and understanding early or late, whether we believe in this promise all our lives or only toward the end, If our conversion is sincere, if our faith is true, then we will not be competing with one another over God's greatest blessing or begrudging one another larger or smaller portions of God's reward. But rather, we will be rejoicing together in gratitude that God in his infinite generosity is offering us all that which we could never have earned on our own for ourselves. Life even beyond death. Life without any limit and the light and peace of his presence. A gift that none of us deserves no longer how long we have been at our faith or how devout and good. So in anticipation of that unending reward which can be ours, but only because Jesus Christ paid the price of his life to obtain it for us. Let us never begrudge nor fail to give thanks and praise to God in the Eucharist given to us by him for that very purpose until we reach the goal of its celebration, which is nothing less than the banquet of endless life in God's kingdom.